possession by which these places have acquired the names by which we now know them are the conditions of possibility for um, our institutions and certainly my professional circumstances that allow me allow us to be here today so thank you um, this talk that I'm gonna give today this talk offers a cultural history of early modern keyboard temperament I situate the emerging temperament discourse from the European 16th to 18th centuries within the dramatic contemporaneous upheavals to natural philosophy and legal, political, economic, and theological thinking that took place in response to the colonization of the so-called New World. My argument is a simple one here. Understandings of tonal spaces as metaphorical spaces in the discourse of temperament are highly characteristic of changes in how early modern Europeans are thinking about literal earthly spaces and the use of land, how early modern Europeans are thinking about nature. And in turn, these conceptions of land and physical territory were shaped intensively by the question of how to manage, utilize, and profit from overseas colonies, their wildernesses, their natural splendor, and their indigenous inhabitants who were thought to exist in the so-called state of nature. Now, the first written murmurings about temperament come at the end of the 15th century, as when Francinus Gifurius, in his 1496 Practica Musicae, tossed off a remark about how organists subject perfect fifths to, quote, a diminution by a very small and hidden and somewhat uncertain quality, quantity, which they call participatio. In the following century, from Pietro Arendt to Zarlino and onwards, the edifice of the discourse on tuning gains a new wing in ever more precise and elaborate descriptions of various mean tone temperaments and later circulating well temperaments, uh, the kinds of keyboard systems that supported works in all keys, like Bach's well-tempered clavier. Now, while the speculative writings about systems of consonances and their cosmic significances use the monochord to look upward and gain insight into the cosmic logics that exercise their power over the sublunary world, keyboard temperament and tuning applies its numerical and calculative rationalities to describe, control, and manipulate the earthly materialities of sounding instruments like the organ and clavichord, or Vicentino's microtoner archicembalo. Um, as keyboard instruments began to compete with the monochord for theoretical dignity, we witness a music theoretical expression of what the historian Peter Harrison describes as the heavenward gaze of earlier rational endeavor getting increasingly turned in early modernity, turned outward over and onto the physical and natural world. The earliest widely systematically described temperaments were called mean tone temperaments, uh, such as quarter comma mean tone, one of the most common and long-lived schemes. 
quarter comma mean tone prioritizes pure major thirds, uh, the five to four frequency ratio. In principle, uh, mean tone is a very simple system. One tunes pure major thirds with the result that the four perfect fifths that span a major third on the circle of fifths, for instance, between E flat to G natural, have to be reduced slightly. This final, uh, sorry, what results are eight pure major thirds, and here on the um, circle of fifths diagram, they're represented by these straight dotted lines. Um, eight pure major thirds and 11 tempered fifths. The final perfect fifth goes across the circle of fifths and harmonic seam, so it is no fifth at all, it is a diminished sixth. This interval, often between G sharp and E flat, is howlingly dissonant, profuse with acoustic beating. It was known as the Wolf Fifth by 1511 at the latest, when it appears as such in Arnold Schlick's Spiegel der Orgelmacher und Organisten, probably reflecting language, reflecting language already in use among organists and organ builders. And let me just show you what the quarter comma mean tone circle of fifths sounds like. So in much of the music theoretical writing that describes mean tone temperaments, the term wolf is usually just treated as a technical term for a certain ersatz fifth within the temperament. Uh, some theorists, however, take the opportunity to develop at length this animal metaphor. For instance, in his remarks on tuning and temperament, Michael Pretorius in his Syntagma Musicum of 1619 designates as wolf any profusely beating interval, such as the mean tone wolf fifth, but also augmented seconds or tritones. Um, and he does not mince words in his evaluative judgments. He writes, quote, the best thing is to leave the wolf howling in the wood where he belongs and not let him disturb our harmonious concords, end quote. Praetorius figures acoustic beating and discord in terms of a nuisance animality meant to be banished, managed, quelled, and quarantined. He contrasts the wolf fifth to the cultiva cultiv cultivated, civilized, well-harmonized space of concord. Now, the wolf, specifically as a figuration of spiritual threats and adversaries, appears throughout Old Testament and New Testament scriptures, and the sections devoted to wolves in medieval bestiaries invariably write about the animal as an allegory for the devil. The 13th century Aberdeen bestiary, for instance, tells its readers that, quote, the fact that the wolf cannot turn his neck without turning the whole of his body signifies that the devil never turns toward the direction of penitence, end quote. It asks, for, for what do we mean by the wolf, if not the devil? Now, in contrast, Edward Topsell's 1607 bestiary, The History of Four-Footed Beasts, cites these sorts of older understandings and even passes on the dubious remark about wolves not being able to turn their necks. Um, the Aberdeen bestiary's discussion of wolves is mainly directed towards what the wolf teaches about Satan and one's spiritual conduct. What's new in Topsell's bestiary is its lengthy disquisition about why to be wary of literal wolves, the dangers they pose to people and livestock, and how to exterminate them. Topsell writes that, quote, men have been forced to invent and find out many devices for the destroying of wolves. It had been such a shameful misery to endure the tyranny of such spoiling beasts without laboring for resistance and revenge, end quote. Topsell documents various wolf traps, wolf hunting techniques, and methods of poisoning. So the shift that takes place between these, uh, the, the times in which these two bestiaries were written is characteristic of a broader shift <clears throat> in the meanings of nature, uh, certainly across the beginning in the 16th and into the 18th centuries. The historian Peter Harrison argues that early modern thinkers began to see the literal earthly wilderness and their flora and fauna not as primarily sources of spiritual lessons, but as fallen spaces full of beasts that Christian man was duty bound to occupy, improve, cultivate, and manage. Um, Harrison points to Bishop Lancelot Andrews of the Church of England who proclaimed that quote from the pulpit, if we quote, win a country where no habitation hath been or which hath not been habitable for because of wild beasts, by chasing from thence the beasts and by subduing that country it becometh our own. Andrews adds, the last point of subjicite terram, the imperative to subdue the earth, is the employing, that is, the labor, 
that is, to labor, turmoil, to break it up, to harrow and plow it. This is for husbandry, to dung it and manure it for pastures, to make houses and buildings for the architect, to make gardens and enclosures for solace, end quote. So endorsed from the pulpit, ideas like these were not just peculiar to the English context. They also appear in the legal and political writings of Spanish, Spanish Dutch, German, and French jurists. Uh, Peter Harrison summarizes, quote, working the earth and transforming the natural landscape were no longer simply a means to an end, but ends in themselves. A final incentive for this energetic engagement with the material world came with the linkage of the imperative have dominion to justifications of property ownership and colonization, end quote. So Mean Tone's wolf is meant to be chased out of commonly used keys, extirpated and banished into a harmonically re remote nether region of the circle of fifths. The wolf fifth and its bestial demonic connotations, as in Michael Pretorius's writings, took place within an intellectual context that increasingly understood physical spaces and their animal elements in terms of emerging notions of political rights and theologically sanctioned duties to cultivate and maximally utilize the terrain of the earth, the right and duty to subdue the earth by subduing its wildernesses and its unbidden beasts and threats. The metaphorical uh, imaginative language in discourses of tuning and temperament clarifies itself further in the 18th century. A pioneer of, well, uh, of circulating well temperaments, Georg Andreas Zorga, with his Vorgemacht der Musikalischen Komposition, invokes the wolf's demonic and bestial significations in a colorful pronouncement of the outdatedness of quarter comma mean tone schemes by that time, wherein the wolf fifth is commonly located on the circle of fifths between G sharp and E flat. Sorga writes, quote, on most old organs, A flat to E flat is tuned much too high, much too wide, beats much too rapidly. Unfortunately, that sounds like when the devil and his grandmother hold a concert with one another. For many truly famous organ makers bury their stinking so-called wolf in A flat major. Thus, in their organs, they have indeed a G sharp to E, but no A flat to C, an E flat to G, but uh, yeah, E flat to G, but no D sharp to B, an F sharp to D, but no uh, no G flat to B flat, a C sharp to A, but no D flat to F. End quote. Uh, Sorga is lamenting that mean tone temperaments do not permit and harmonic reinterpretations of tones, thereby rendering certain harmonic centers and harmonic motions off limits. In Sorga's remarks, the old but familiar quarter comma mean tone temperament itself, due to the very presence of the wolf fifth therein, comes to signify the fallen qualities that reason and technique in the form of more modern temperament schemes are meant to overcome. Sorga's remarks are committed to technological progress. But not only this, he detests how mean tone temperaments result in unutilized, unusable tonal and harmonic space. This abhorrence towards under-leveraged, un under-cultivated, unused space is highly redolent of how early modern thinkers increasingly regarded maximal utilization of earthly territory as a self-evident good and duty, while the underutilization of space, which was in this time commonly attributed to indigenous Americans, signified a kind of deleterious indolence and failure to bring God's earth towards its Edenic redemption. The uh, American colonial clergyman, John Cotton, for instance, wrote in 1634, quote, in a vacant soil, he that taketh possession of it and bestoweth culture and husbandry upon it, his right it is. And, this, and the ground of this is from the grand charter given to Adam and his posterity in paradise. Genesis 128 reads, multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it. If therefore any son of Adam come and find a place empty, he hath liberty to come and fill and subdue the earth there, end quote. It is not only men of the cloth making pronouncements of this kind. From the 16th to 18th centuries, early modern jurists, jurists were at work in a neighboring discourse of early international law <clears throat> called jus gentium, literally law of nations, which sought to supply the legal juridical frameworks for justifying the dominion of earthly space to restore it to some semblance of its prelapsarian condition in the Garden of Eden via the colonial projects and the plantation. Its key architects were thinkers like Francisco de, de Vittoria, Alberico Gentili, Hugo Grotius, Samuel Pufendorf, John Locke, Thomas Hobbes, Emmer Vettel, and so on. One of the earlier articulations of early modern use gentium 
Alberico Gentili's 1588 through 89 treatise De Jure Belli attests that, quote, the seizure of vacant space is regarded as a law of nature. The law of nature abhors a vacuum, end quote. Gentili helped normalize the idea that underutilized space is abhorrent to nature, to logic, and to the heavens. This imperative positioned itself to justify colonial seizure of indigenous lands on the ground that indigenous societies were overwhelmingly lazy according to European perceptions and failing to properly cultivate the bounty of the American continent's geography. At the other temporal end of the discourse of early modern Jus Gentium, before it fully becomes uh, what we would call political economy, um, Emmer Vattel's uh, 1758 Law of Nations speaks to the same complex of rights to the seizure of land. He writes, quote, nations such as the ancient Germans and some modern Tartars who inhabit fertile countries but disdain to cultivate their lands and, chose, and choose to live rather by plunder are wanting to themselves, are injurious to all their neighbors and deserve to be extirpated as savage and pernicious beasts, end quote. So as Sorry. So um, let me continue. As Peter Harrison describes in this imaginary, quote, uncultivated land was clear evidence of indolent inhabitants. Numerous observers con commented on the endemic idleness of the indigenous Americans, end quote. So the early modern virtue accorded to maximal utilization of terrestrial space and the extirpation of its bestial and primitive elements, uh, foundations of the legal machinery justifying colonial invasion and occupation, are conditions of possibility for Sorge's vehement proscription against the use of Kurokama mean tone on the grounds of its underutilization of tonal space. The construction of physical spaces of human dwelling and civilizational power acts as an explicit metaphor for temperament in Johann Georg Neidhardt's Sexio Canonis of 1724, two decades before Sorga. Neidhardt proposed three unequal temperaments with progressively smaller differences between good and bad major thirds and an equal temperament. The most unequal temperament with the best thirds, but also, of course, the greatest distortions to uncommonly used keys he designates as vor ein Dorf, for a village. Closer to equal temperament was vor ein, eine kleine Stadt, for a town or small city, um, yet closer to equal temperament was vor eine große Stadt for a large city, while equal, equal temperament itself he designated as vor den Hof for the court. Presumably, Neidhart thought that increasingly populated and urban settings would be home to increasingly chromatic repertoires, demanding circulating temperaments, while more rustic settings with less harmonically adventurous musics would be better served by having sweeter major thirds, though uh, fewer highly usable keys. Whatever Neidhart's reasoning, what is of note is that the four temperaments of interest are structured as a progression toward progression across increasingly intensive infrastructures for dwelling on land, from the village to the town to the city to the court. Neidhart's temperaments were published in a time when Europeans considered it to be self-evidently obvious the divine favor belonged to building up and civilizing earthly spaces according to European patterns of habitation and dwelling. Finally, uh, the language of tuning, intervals, consonances, and harmony also supplied some of the vocabulary of colonial authors to render disparaging judgments of indigenous societies. Some colonial chronicles disseminated judgments of tuning and of the scalar and intervallic qualities they attributed to indigenous and other non-European music and vocality. For one example, the late 17th and 18th centuries most widely read and translated chronicler of the Mexican conquests Antonio Solis y Ribadinera, appeals in one instance of musical description to a notion of indigenous music being mistuned. In his 1684 History of the Conquest of, the Mex of Mexico by the Spaniards, Solis describes indigenous Mexican funeral customs for high status persons in which members of the household of the deceased are slain so as to accompany into the afterlife the great one whom they served in this life. The 1724 first English edition reads, quote, they put to death some of their servants to accompany them, and it was a common thing for wives to celebrate the exequies, the funeral rites, of their husbands with their own death. The bodies were carried with great pomp and solemnity to the temples, from whence their priests came forward to receive them with their copper censers, singing to the sound of hoarse and ill-tuned flutes, hymns, and funeral elegies in a dismal, melancholy tone." End quote. This remark concerning ill-tunedness arises from the passage's alarmed confrontation with Nahua, uh, ethnically central Mexican cosmologies. 
It is inextricably linked to Solis's broader portrayal of indigenous people as superstitious and gratuitously bloodthirsty. This judgment and others like it functioned among its audiences to characterize non-Europeans in terms of primitiveness, devilishness, and hence legitimacy as targets of extractivist colonization and its enslavement economies. But colonial ear witness to non-European societies also at times transmitted more favorable judgments of indigenous sound with complex results that again articulate with the political, economic, and theological rationalities of 16th to 18th century Europe. In the Jesuit missionary Jose de Acosta's Natural and Moral History of the Indies, Acosta describes the dance tradition and genre of festivity called a mitote uh, in Nahuatl, the, the language family native to central Mexico. Um, Acosta writes, quote, this dance or mitote was commonly made in the courts of the temple and in those of the king's houses, which were more spacious. They did place in the midst of the court two instruments, one like to a drum and the other like a barrel made of one piece and hollow within which they set upon the form of a man, a beast, or upon a pillar. These two instruments were so well accorded together that they made a good harmony. And with these instruments, they made many kinds of airs and songs. They did all sing and dance to the sound and measure of these instruments with so goodly an order and an accord, both of their feet and voices, as it was a pleasant thing to behold." End quote. This image of behavioral and acoustic well-coordinatedness that Acosta describes was meant to bespeak civilized capabilities among the Nahua to behave as well-organized publics worthy of being assimilated into a harmonious colonial polity. As an early modern European missionary, Acosta was a member of projects of domination routed through more complex means than just gratuitous subjugation. Rather than articulating notions of indigenous societies, heathenishness through notions of mistuning, Acosta's sonic language here instead uses his tes testimony to an indigenous society's good tuning to metaphorize a vision shared by Acosta and the Spanish crown that pictured colonization as a divinely and naturally preordained process of extending spiritually, economically, and politi politically harmonious control over earthly spaces and their inhabitants. So to conclude, as Phil Ewell has written, quote, one of music theory's greatest feats is its ability to sever its own past from, its pres from the present. If some historical aspect of a theory is unseemly or unsavory, we typically bury it and move on. And so I'd like to leave us with uh, a reminder from Michel Rolf Trio's Silencing the Past, who says, quote, we are never as steeped in history as when we pretend not to be. But if we stop pretending, we may gain an understanding of what we lose in false innocence. Naivete is often an excuse for those who exercise power. For those upon whom the power is exercised, naivety is always a mistake. Thank you. Notation, inscription, and visualization. Um, and then her talk today is titled Theorizing the Temperate Zone The Circulation of Musical Medical Theories of Pulse in the Greater Mediterranean. Thanks and welcome, Julia. Thank you so much, Sophie. Just a second. Is this working? Yeah, okay. Well, thanks so much for the presentation and for all of you for being here today. Uh, my talk is titled Theorizing from the Temperate Zone, the Circulation of Musical Medical Theories of Pulse in the Greater Mediterranean. So the pulse, or beat, constitutes the basic element of Western theories of meter and rhythm. 
But for physician, the pulse serves as a fundamental vital sign and diagnostic means. The analogy that links the medical and musical pulse has quite a long history, with the work of Galen of Pergamon constituting the main source about pulse theory from antiquity. It is through his work we learn that the founder of Greek sorry, sphygmology, which means pulse theory, was the physician Aerophilus of Alexandria, who identified the pulse through the section. This allowed him to see the structure of the artery as tubular, as well as to determine the pulse, that the pulse consisted of alternation between a diastole, a dilation, and a systole contraction. Galen would ultimately devote the six books to observation about the functioning of the pulse here shown in their Latin titles. Several centuries later, uh, translations appeared uh, first in Syriac, by which root eventually appeared in Arabic and then in Latin. Since medical treatises do not constitute an obvious source of music theory, this tradition has been generally overlooked in our field. While historians of medicine and science have given the sources more attention, their focus is, is mainly on how music informed medical theory and practice. The historians of science, Shigehisa Kuriyama, for instance, recounts how Western doctors were quick to latch onto their correspondence between the regular systolic diastolic palpitation of the pulse and rhythmic temporality, con conceived of in linear terms as impulses Oh, sorry. What's going on? Okay. So the connection between I was is this is this happening? Like is it, it has been happening throughout? Yeah. Um I have my own. So we were talking about the polls. <laughs> okay. You got all of that? Yes, we were here. Um, mm, 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 mm. Okay, yeah. Since medical treatises do not constitute an obvious source of music theory, this tradition has been generally overlooked in our field. Um, while historians of medicine and science have given these sources more attention, this fo their focus is mainly on how music informed medical theory and practice. So I was bringing in the example of historian of science Shigeisa Kuriyama who recounts how Western doctors were quick to latch onto the correspondence between the regular systolic diatolic, uh, diastolic palpitations of the pulse and rhythmic temporality, conceived of in linear terms as impulses that articulated moments in the for forward flow of time. And as Alexander re writing in a recent article, sorry, Alexander writing in a recent article cites Kuriyama's work as evidence of how musical theories of rhythm have informed medical theories of the pulse offering yet another powerful indication of the influence of music on other fields in the humanities and sciences. But what if we also look at things the other way around? That is, how did this physiological and anatomical understanding of the pulse shape the ways in which people thought about musical temporality in the greater Mediterranean? This paper emerges from one of my dissertation chapters. Um, sorry. In the dissertation, I investigate more broadly how people in the medieval Greater Mediterranean measure musical time. My perspective is informed by historical anthropology and media theory in particular, as I understand knowledge, and in this very case, the knowledge of musical time, as something distinguished and configured in the very course of what paleontologist André Leroy Gourand described as a process of exteriorization. Cognitive processes through which ideas are conceptualized, in other words, are configured through the inscription, mental or actual, of these ideas onto the surfaces of the bodies in the world around us. How is musical time inscribed mentally or actually in the objects of the world around us, then is the question. It is through these forms of exteriorization that information about musical time is configured, reflected upon, and made transmissible. In other words, it is through exteriorization that they become knowable. My contention, then, is that it is through the anatomical structure to which the spirit moves, generating a pulsation, and in doing so, making itself detectable, 
through the interface, the surface of the skin, the music temporality is apprehended not only throughout antiquity, but also in the Middle Ages. In the first part of this, sorry, in all of this, yeah. In the first part of this presentation, we zoom in, focusing on the pulsation of the spirit within the artery and unpacking the analogy of this motion as a musical motion in time. I will rely on one of the sources I've discovered in the course of my work, a remarkable inedited commentary in Judeo-Arabic of Ibn Sina's canon, which expands greatly on the musical medical analogy. This text I show sheds light on frameworks from, for understanding musical time that circulated throughout the greater Mediterranean before the emergence of major notation, thus challenging any idea that Krishnet and Islamic tradition developed independently, sealed off from each other. In connection with the theme of this pre-conference, I argue that this has radical implication for many of the theories we typically identify as Western by disrupting myths that their origins are white, Christian, and European, and demonstrating that development stems from networks of interaction between theories from the Afro-Eurasian region of the Greater Mediterranean, the span Christian and Islamic worlds. In the second part, we zoom out uh, from the technical modes of exteriorization of the pulse and focus instead on the role of the pulse in elemental philosophy and theories of climate. The focus does will be on the role the music theory played in shaping notion of identity within the greater Mediterranean context. And I will present preliminary finding uh, focus on how medieval Islamic theories combine theories of poles, theories of climates um, into um, climatic, determina climatic deterministic framework and approach with striking, striking resonances to the white racial frame that has constrained musical scholarship in the modern age. So part one. My informant for part one uh, of this talk is Solomon Ibn Yaish, a physician from Seville, died in 1345, who left us a lengthy discourse on the analogy between the mus musical and medical pulse. While this is a source from the 14th century, it quotes a great deal of other uh, physicians and music theorists uh, showing how this is um, you know, a long tradition. The passage of, the mo of most interest to us today is, comes from his commentary of book one of Ibn Sina's canons, which contains a key passage about the musicality of the pulse. While the passage in Ibn Sina is relatively short and does, does not really explain the content of the analogy, Ibn Ayesh has spent citing earlier sources and also explaining it in its own terms. This work survives into sources and was written in Judeo-Arabic, that is Arabic but with Hebrew letters, as you can see. And to interpret this manuscript, to translate it, I collaborated with Ebrist Francesca Gorgoni, who provided me with a transliteration of the Hebrew script into Arabic. So I worked from there towards a complete translation of the passage on Pulse. Among the many reasons this manuscript is particularly exciting, um, I lost, okay, is not only the fact that it constitutes one of the few sources that expands on this analogy, but also that it testified to how the musical section from Ibn Sina, The Cure, or Al-Farabi, Great Book of Music, or at least its companion from, by Abu Assalt, were read and known in the Iberian Peninsula still in the 14th century. According to Ibn Yaish, the motion of the human spirit was at the basis of the production of the pulsation of the arteries, connecting the heart and moving towards the body's limbs, because circulation was not yet discovered. While this analogy seems to be premised only upon rhythm, it actually comprehended both rhythmical rela relationship, nisba ikaiya, and pitch relationship, uh, or pitch, um, pitch like, compositional like relationship, meaning basically the composition of notes in terms of pitches, nisma uh, talifia. This is the two elements, uh, musical elements by which the tune, lachen, is brought to perfection. So uh, Yaish writes, the attack is the beating of a solid body with another solid body with a thin extremity, and this is uh, almost quote of a passage from Al-Farabi, through which one signals the beginning of the note. And its relation to the duration of the notes is comparison to the relation of the present moment with respect to duration. So the beginning of the note would be the present moment, and then the duration of the note, it's the duration that follows. And in other words, the situation of the point with respect to the line. So the note would be the point, and the line is only apprehended throughout um, by um, 
calculating the distance between the two points, between the two points of attack. This idea constitutes the basis of the analogy between the motion of a performer striking a string and that of the pose. We might represent it as so. The performer strike as the string. Um, following there is a moment of rest that allows the performer to change the direction of his motion to the string again. Uh, so we have string, strike rest motion and then strike again. In the case of the pose, we have the peak of the expansion that we feel under the finger pads, followed by a rest and then the opposite motion towards a peak of contraction. The greatest difference between the two analogous patterns is that we cannot feel the peak of contraction in the pose, um, you know, on the finger pads. And so what the doctor ultimately holds in relation is the distance between one peak of expansion and the next one. The impression of the artery and the striking of a note are analogies for the impression formed by the note in one imagination. This is also something we learn from Ibn Yaish. In fact, in another passage, he says that, uh, for instance, whenever there is a long duration in between the attacks, the form of the first note disappears from the imagination and no composition between notes occurs at all. For the, this very reason, he tells us in a later passage that the motion and rest between expansion must be quick enough to be musically understood, that is, to be understood as part of a musical continuum. Then he also goes on on the uh, analogy between pitch relationship and the, and the pulse. Um, he tells us the strong pulsation resembles the sharp note because the strong pulsation is what pushes away the fingers violently, and the vigor of the sharp nose is what impresses in the sense of hearing the strongest effect. And therefore, the weak pulsation resembles the heavy note, and the relation which is in between the strong and the weak pulse is similar to the relationship that is in between the sharp and heavy note. And now we can really see in this passage why, you know, both in Greek and Arabic, the meaning of sharp and heavy, there is this idea that, you know, what we call an higher pitch actually is sharp and penetrates Deep, more deeply on the surface either of the skin or maybe I would suggest the wax tablet which was a common inscribing medium at the time. So the pulse does operate quite literally as an inscription on the skin surface perceived by the finger of the physician in the binary language of impression, lack of impression. A higher note, it tells us, produce a deeper impression that passes quickly in the listener imagination, whereas a low note produces a more superficial impression but that lasts longer. In short, what the mechanics of the pulse provides, I argue, is, is a mode of exteriorization of, of musical time that is specifically diagrammatic. Um, the skin of the wrist works as an interface between the visible and invisible by recording the impression of motion. So as the symmetrician Charles Sander Peirce notes, diagram and I quote, encode the part of one thing by analogous relations in the other parts, end quote. Following his logic to think about musical motion through the interface of the pulsating skin um, is ultimately a diagrammatic operation because it's a way of recording this analogy on the surface uh, of the skin. Through the pulse, as it is detected on the skin, we have perceived musical motion in spatial terms. They are then mediated by touch and vision as the relationship between a point and a lack of, of point. The lack of point, then it's, let's say, further translated in geometrical terms by Ibn Yaish that tells us that we should understand it as a line. So this way of understanding temporal relationship in music operates in theorists' understanding of musical sound in performance. For example, Al-Farabi, as I was saying earlier, talks about the striking of a string as a dimensionless moment of attack followed by a rest and a motion towards another attack. So, uh, but it could also be recognized, I would suggest here, in this diagram from the Musica in Kyriades, the anonymous ninth century treatise often held up as the first to establish the rules of polyphony for Western art music. Well, the story we often tell is that the temporal dimension of style is not really represented in notation before menstrual notation. I would say that what we have seen in Ibn Yaish likely suggests the presence of a continuous music theoretical tradition that would allow for the diagrams such as these to also be read in a temporal sense as the you know, we see basically the non-visible dot that would contain the line, so the extreme of the line, as this dimensionless space of the now, 
uh, in which the soul is impressed by the form of the pitch and the syllable, followed by an uh, intentional motion towards the next pitch. Today we think quite differently and would probably put it the other way around. Um, or this transformation, to borrow freely from the lingo of transformational theory between pitches, for, not, for us would occupy a dimensionless instant, the point, while the line would constitute the duration of the note. We think of notes as um, you know, possessing a dimension. Well, here it's kind of, you know, in, in this case, it's the other way around, I'm suggesting. This leads me to the first point I want to make about music theory and identity. This cultural technique through which the note is a dimensionless, is reduced to a dimensionless point and duration is the line between notes, is not the product solely of a Christianate or Islamic world, uh, two spheres, the historiography often holds or treats as separate, but instead emerges and engenders its own cultural space in which these two worlds coexist. That space is what uh, I would call the greater Mediterranean, and we have yet to fully think through the implication of this observation for how we identify medieval music theorists and musical texts like this one as Western or not. Part two. In the second part of this talk, I would like to briefly focus on questions of music theory and identity from a different perspective, one that zooms out from the technical modes by which knowledge of the pulse was exteriorized and focuses instead on how the pulsating spirit within the human was understood within the broader system of elemental philosophy that predominated in the medieval Islamic world. By the phrase elemental philosophy, I'm referring to the widely distributed theory that uh, all nature and environment, the sublunary world, was composed out of varying combination of four primary elements, are earth, water, air, and fire. So according to medieval philosophy, the human pulse was carried by the blood and constituted by a mix of air and fire, and the rate of pulsation and mixture uh, with inhaled air would ensure that the spirit was ignited or cooled down to an equitable point, ideally. The air individual breathed uh, was, uh, however, thought to be qualitatively different according to the latitude they lived. The atmosphere was different. To make sense of the effects of latitudes on the human body, philosophers divided the globe into either five or sometimes seven zones with a scorching zone in the middle around the equator, two frigid zones around the poles, and the two temperate zones here in green, as you can see in the middle. So given the importance placed on the time of, type of air or of atmosphere that people live into, um, the climatic characteristics of these zones were seen as determining factors in shaping the ethnic and racial identities particular to each zone. The inhabitants of the temperate zone, which included the residents of the greater Mediterranean, uh, breathed temperate air and thus had more chances to be gifted with a temperate pulse. Uh, it was not the same for those in the south of the 15th parallel, including the Zinj, literally black and generally associated with sub-Saharan Africa or those living north of the 45th parallel. We see here the origins of what we could call climatic determinism, the ideology that climate determines the physical attributes and mental characteristics of human bodies and gives rise to ethnic and racial difference. Ibn Sina in The Cure, as she does, lists latitude and region of provenance as a determinant factor of human <coughs> temperament that is the balance between the elements that compose each individual, although he actually uh, says that those living in the equatorial climate were better suited than in those in the temperate one, but the, that's kind of an exception to the rule, and he acknowledges that everyone else thinks differently. My question then is, given the entanglement between the medical pulse and climate, was, the, was, the climate, was climate also thought to have an impact on individual musicality? In other words, does the way in which people, individuals, understood and constructed climate also have an effect on discourses and practices in music theory? Did the self-consciousness of theorists in the greater Mediterranean that they fell within the temperate zone shape the way in which they conceived who could be a music theorist, who could be musically, naturally? I'm still at the beginning of my research. This is the basis of one of my post-dissertation projects, but my preliminary answer is yes. The most explicit passage to this end, focused not on rhythm or pulse, but actually the ability to appreciate consonants, can be found in Al-Farabi's great book of music. 
This passage of Farabi states that the musical, co musical consonances can be judged as natural if they satisfy one ear. However, explain that not every year is the same for the effects of latitude, specifically on people condition, natural or unnatural hearing. hearing. Abnormal hearing characterizes those south of the 15th parallel and north of the 45th, as he specifies. Um, he also specified, you know, the, the, the one of the south of the 15th parallel are the genes, the sub-Saharan Africans. The Arabs, however, who lived in the temperate areas, shared with the Romans and the Greeks, um, the share with the Roman and Greeks, benefited from a climate that granted them an enhanced ability to perceive and comprehend music. Thus, according to Farabi, the lands within these latitudes were not only civilized and their population bonded in kinship because the Arabs, he suggests, should read Greek music theory and then and learn uh, Roman and Byzantine melodies as they were simply different manifestation of the one and only natural music. In the work of another Islamic theorist of the 13th century, Al-Urmawi, there are also hints into how medieval theorists thought that one's temperament determined by the climate they lived in had an effect on their sense of musical time or pulse. In his dissertation, the musicologist Anas Rab highlights how for Al-Urmawi, the order between rhythmic durations and cycles could be mastered only by those of a healthy temperament, and those had the right pulse to be able to perceive the logic of musical rhythm. In short, some people had the background to acquire music theoretical abilities naturally or through intense work, but others could not uh, uh, you know, access, have access to an, a musical understanding of this phenomena at all because of the natural temperament. They could benefit from music, actually, to try to adjust this, their temperament as much as possible, but they could not produce themselves music theoretical knowledge, which in a is Aristotelian framework was, uh, upper, you know, the, the beginning point of, of theorizing was experience. Uh, what we see then is the construction in the medieval era of an argument about who had the innate constitution to be a theorist and who did not. The resonance between this logic and the logic of the white racial frame that has shaped more recent music theoretical discourse, I believe is telling. I want to conclude with a final question then, one that guides my future research. Just how ancient is the music theoretical tendency to identify who is fit to be a music theorist? What might the medieval past tell us about the situation we find ourselves in now, the present? Thank you. Thanks so much to both of you, and maybe you will not join me on the stage. I hope we have some time for some questions before we are thrown out of the hall. Um, but since your papers resonate so nicely, do you want to have a, sit, a seat with me? Um, yeah, it's time to, I guess, connect them and also just um, pose individual questions. And I also want to invite people online to put in comments. I will try my best to watch that uh, space and read out comments that might come in from there, but maybe we start here. Any comments or questions for either one of the speakers? Just yes. comment, it's yes. lovely to see music theorizing flourishing in this frigid zone. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely, I wonder what that means about our pulse. Uh, but <laughs> Uh, thanks to both of you for really rich arguments. Um, this is really a question for Andrew. Um, the, the, the origins or the, the birth, I guess, of temperament, as you, as you put it. I'm thinking of, um, I guess it's Bartolome Ramis de Pariah, a little bit earlier than Gaforio. He, he has this weird method of laying out the monochord that I think gets close to, to just intonation, if, if memory serves, but I don't think he talks about it. Is that does that count, I guess, is the question, as, as an early form or early demonstration of, of temperament? Sure. Um, you know, what, 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 where, I'm, where I would just go with that um, off the top of my head is that, you know, that was, that was, it was controversial because he was admitting intervals that weren't just based on um, pure major fifths and compounds of, of pure major fifths. So, you know, there, there's, a, there's a kind of like um, uh, 
system of, of like numbers that, that, are, that are like allow, allowed or that are certain like exalted numerical relations and some you know less um, dignified ones. Um, so I you know I guess like when, when you look at the history from uh, Ramos de Perea and into the next century, like we see a shift in, in kind of the meaning of number um, during this time where um, uh, you know this sort of orthodoxy in the history of theory where, where we say um, you know before let's say 1500 or um, you know number number had, had this uh, very important speculative and yeah, cosmic significance and then and then you know in, after 1600 um, number you know, goes away and it's, instead we're theorizing about vibration and, and things like that but that, that's that's I, I don't think this is really a very good way to tell that story um, the meaning of number changes where uh, before um, these kinds of cosmic significances are very important and are responsible for the kind of disparagement of some of Ramos de Perez, you know, um, like for instance, the, the, his notion that the, the pure major third is admissible into the system, um, but the, the, the meaning of, of number here is, is changing from uh, this domain of a kind of cosmic significance to a way of measuring and um, manipulating and describing uh, the world. So, yeah, you know, certainly the, Ramos de Perez is also a member of this narrative of, of how you know, the concept of numbers is changing. Yeah, true. This is this is still unformed, but it's a way that maybe link your 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 papers. I mean, I was struck by the role that spatiality played in both, whether it be you know the, the barren spaces of an unequal temperament that may contain some vestiges of settler colonialism some ways that you're framing, or the spatiality of, you know, uh, both the movements within the body and then the way that bodies respond to the spaces in which, you know, in which they, they reside, which then the argument is that renders their own bodies and their own temporality either legible or illegible, or at least understandable or un, 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 inexplicable. So I wonder, you know, in some ways, maybe a, a space for the two of you to, to think about what the connections are between spatiality and identity within the kind of frames that you put it. I know it's a huge and, and big question, but it's more an invitation for you to just keep riffing on this. Um, I don't have an answer, I don't want to get stuck. I'll, I'll keep thinking about this. I mean, I totally see the, the connection. Uh, I feel that um, what I'm interested in is more, is more micro intimate um, dimension while in the case of Andrew we're talking about um, um, environmental understanding of, of space you know, in a um, um, larger larger overview um, but actually in going into this direction I had a question for you um, if I understood well you said that temperament allowed for the a better exploitation of space, um, and uh, you, you know. Uh, but then, you know, I was thinking about how, in the moment, for example, in the space of the tone, that's the moment in which we think about it in equal temperament, and it closes up. Like you, you get the toroid, right? Then somehow you're reducing space. You're exploring like. Somehow not having equal temperament allows you to explore an infinite space. So I was wondering what you were thinking about this. Oh, yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, <clears throat> I, so I'm, what's popping into my head now that you've said this, is this on? Yes. Um, is the chapter in the Oxford Handbook of Critical Concepts and Music Theory, um, the chapter by uh, Stefan Hamill and Brian Parkhurst, um, where they, like, they basically, they, they describe um, equal temperament as, you, you know, an economic decision by, by piano manufacturers. Um, so, I don't know, I mean, there's, there's, there's also uh, something of this just, like, ruthless efficiency um, going on in equal temperament. Uh, 
equal temperament is, is a system where every key is like equally disfigured in this like horrible you know neoliberal analogy. <laughs> um, another answer to Professor Hicks's question is probably forthcoming in our panel on Saturday. <laughs> Maybe. That's where I would go to look. Um, yeah, you know, I, I think that the, you know, these, these concepts of, of like who belongs to the temperate zone um, is such an interesting one. Um, you know, certainly in, in the period that I'm talking about, uh, like British thinkers are, have this anxiety over the fact that the Islamic tradition would have said that they're members of the, you know, frigid, dull-witted people. And, you know, the kind of cachet of signifying yourself as a member of some kind of concept of the temperate zone is, continues to be very important to, to people. Thank you both so much. I really, there's a lot to think about. Um, and, but I want to ask uh, uh, Julia, the, um, I really like the, the sort of the move to break down some of the separation between the sort of Islamic and, and Western traditions. But one, and, and maybe you can, but one kind of distinction that occurred to me uh, was sort of the material that's sort of used to, to develop these theoretical traditions. Like you, you, to like overly simplify, you could say one is based on an instrument, like strings and kind of tuning, and then one is based, you could say, on a vocal tradition, right? Like the, once again, Kiriannis. And that kind of, I wondered if that was not necessarily a hard and fast distinction, but one maybe worth developing, and, and even whether the breath was, is also a kind of a periodic kind of uh, phenomenon, sort of like the pulse in some way. Yes, I, I, I sorry. Uh, yes, I do think there might be um, a point there in the sense that um, the, the instrumental tradition, if we think about you know, a number of instruments of the, of the Islamic tradition, they would produce um, very short envelopes, basically. Uh, so sounds are more like a talk. I think about the wood, you know, striking with the plectrum or percussions of orange kind. And I think that that kind of shapes uh, has, has a role in, in this understanding of, you know, pointillistic almost understanding of, of the note. Um, while when you are able with the voice to sustain a, a note, I mean, that's, that's a very different understanding of, of duration. Um, there, are, there is a later treatises from the beginning of the 14th century from Cairo that actually explicit, you know, kind of explicits that issue of the difference of what happens when you are using the platform on a hood or instead sustaining the voice and how, um, in, you know, in, uh, for example, um, notating a rhythmic cycle, one would have to uh, keep adding uh, a unit of duration, but th that doesn't mean that uh, the, um, there is a new sound, it's just a prolongation of the one before, because, uh, you know, it would die very quickly otherwise. Uh, so, uh, I'm still thinking through these, uh, but yes, I think there's something there. Yeah. I, I uh, am wrapping my, around my mind about something that uh, Andrew, you were taught, you showed this graph about how um, uh, the simpler people uh, uh, they profited from these more pure <coughs> intervals, whereas if you were a more sophisticated person, more cultured, more, more developed, you uh, perhaps uh, equal temperament or more tempered scales were more appropriate. But Julia, you're talking about how uh, as a being, as a natural person, it's, it, it uh, would predispose you more to be more able to write music theory just from your basic being. And, um, I'm just thinking about how how these are contrasting ideas, and I don't know exactly. Yeah. Um, 
So when you were just uh, reminding us about this passage from Andrew Stocks, I thought about there is this passage from Aristoxenus where he says that the diatonic genre is the first one that the, the human encounters, and then uh, you know the chromatic uh, would be uh, and then harmonic would be you know the last one. I mean what that means to me is that there is a a musical develop a aesthetic in terms really of like the development of your perception that has to happen to to um, you know refine the way that uh, you encounter the musical phenomenon is not it's not a datum it's not a given actually and uh, in the case of the calls um, I think you know it's it's similar I think that you know the idea is that there is a work to do, but uh, uh, to you know refine your hearing is not again it's not just a, a datum a given, um, but uh, there there were people that because of their constitution and temperament could never get there basically, so um, yeah I think that there is not the understanding that. Uh, you know, someone would just, you know, uh, born a, a musician or, you know, a music theorist and some, but, you know, even uh, in, a, um, there was always a level of mastery involved that needed to come with education and uh, experience. However, because of this Aristotelian framework in which theory needed to, to begin from the experience of the phenomenon, uh, the way that uh, the possibilities for, for the uh, perception of music was, was really uh, fundamental. So it could not just be completely speculative. Um, I, I think where, just where, where I would go with this just very briefly is that I'm, I'm reminded in um, what Julia was saying and uh, in respect to what I, what I talked about at, of, of just the, you know, these, these notions of the universe as being inherently hierarchically ordered um, and of, of, of how self-evident this idea was um, you know, prior to modernity um, and you know, the, the ways in which like, music and the notion of harmony um, itself was kind of a name for this wonderful, you know, perfectly ordered Meaning perfectly hierarchized system of sublunary and the cosmic world and of like the inside of the soul and so on. So I think that, in other words, that, that would just be one point of communication um, in regards to what you asked. Okay, um, maybe one final question. Thanks. Thanks so much to you both. Uh, I was just sort of struck how both of your papers are talking about this metaphor between music and environment, and in both cases they're taken to some kind of detrimental and dangerous ends, right? And so I was wondering now, in a time of eco-criticism, where there's a lot of optimism about what a consciousness of the environment, or ecological consciousness, how that might enrich music studies, uh, is there any lessons in these histories for how we think about the relationship between environment and music? Or maybe these are just two completely different ways of thinking about environment. Maybe things have changed so much. And I'm wondering if you think that there's any connection to be made or any lesson. Uh, I, for me personally, and I didn't think this through, but it's kind of a um, you know, just reaction to what you said. It's, uh, as I was saying before, this idea of uh, cultivation of the body, of the, the senses and, and the perception of what surrounds you and how that is important to um, tune yourself the best way instead of imposing yourself. I mean, we are in a place that has a wonderful climate, the most lovely <laughs> I can think of, and Nevertheless, we are in this frigid room. Why? <laughs> <laughs> There's something wrong <laughs> with uh, the way that uh, we are using our senses. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, we are not tuning in uh, to the place 
Ngoại xã hội My cheeky answer to this is that more answers will be forthcoming on our panel on Saturday. <laughs> okay, and I think with both of these comments, we'll close for the day to get us out in a more temperate climate. Um, but let's thank our speakers again. Um, for